Welcome back to another episode of Key Factors Podcast. I am your host, Mark Jones, and we are sponsored by ReviewMyMortgage.com, the largest index of mortgage programs nationally. And today I have some pretty cool friends on the podcast. I've been trying to get him on for quite some time, um, and he's finally here. Uh, so without further ado, I would like to introduce Charlie Wasson. Hey, Mark. And Elisa Wasson. This is my beautiful wife and extremely talented real estate partner. I love it. I love it. <laughs> Guys, finally, the time has come for us to chat it out about anything you want. Um, obviously, real estate, mortgage related, entrepreneurial spirited. But before we get into that, I want to tell the folks where you guys came from, who you are, to give a little bit of perspective. So if you could um, take a few moments to let us know what the heck is, what, what who are the Wassons? Well, we are realtors. We're with the Laffey Hilger Group. And just like every realtor I've ever met, Mark, neither of us in third grade looked at our teacher and said, I want to be a realtor when I grow up. <laughs> my mom was a realtor oh, and true. I did not want to be <laughs> my mom. <laughs> Hell no. <laughs> well, look awesome. what happened. At least tell everybody a little bit about your background and and. Etc. Grew up in middle America in Missouri. Okay. Met Charlie when I was 23. Married him when I was 25. Okay. Um, we had some babies. Lived in Alaska. Lived in Waco. Live here now. Uh, kids are 24 and 20. Okay. Uh, became a realtor about five years ago. Uh, before that, I was a retail fashion merchandising fashionista no. <laughs> i sold stuff okay, and, okay. and a preschool teacher i did teacher. too back in high school but we yeah. can't talk about that <laughs> yeah right <laughs> different products gotcha gotcha but um anyway done it all preschool teacher stay-at-home mom i want to get a little bit into elisa's background we'll tie that in in just a second to yeah. what i think makes her so excellent as a realtor um my background went to the university of kansas rock chalk jayhawk Hey, you. Oh, did that slip out? Yeah. That would always does. Um, At least it wasn't an FU. <laughs> not yet. Went to uh, Kansas, got a journalism degree, ended up a radio broadcaster for almost 20 years. I was a radio DJ. In, would you believe that, everybody? In Alaska. That's what made me fall in love with him. It was his voice. And then you saw him yeah. and we're like, dang Ooh, it. <laughs> it's true what they say about radio guys. They're all fat and ugly. Could you imagine if there was like online dating and stuff like that back in the day? Uh, where you only had his voice to judge and maybe a, a picture in a granular like photograph or uh -huh. something, you'd probably still fall in love. What's not the I love? mean, I really <laughs> only heard his voice. I mean, we're old, so the internet didn't exist. Yeah. yeah. There was no, let me look up this radio sure. DJ. I had to go to one of his remotes to see what he looked wow. like. Wow. Wow. He was cute. <laughs> Live from the Westport Brewing Company. I remember the night she came in. That's cool. Yeah. Tell us about that. <laughs> <laughs> well, if you want to. I was doing a remote. I had like 20, uh, 20 people sitting at a table, and I remember uh, when she walked through the door, because I, I always... Uh, was spotting women as they would yeah, come yeah. into the bar. He wanted to make sure his table Believe was it or woman not, heavy. Well staffed. And when she came in, I said, don't bother. She's way too cute. That's awesome. <laughs> okay. And they were giving away a trip to Cancun. Yeah. And I wanted to win it. Also, I, my girlfriend that I was with, we wanted to go flirt with the DJ. <laughs> and I put my name in the box and I didn't win. No. Nope. Because he stole my name out of the box. Oh. At the end of the night, I, I went through all the entries and I got her name out and kept it. So oh that I would have her phone gosh. number if I ever wanted to call Stalker her. Stalker alert. <laughs> That's awesome. We, that is... we ended up bumping into each other and I said, hey, I'll call you sometime. And she's like, okay, that'll be a fun trick because you don't have my number. And then I did have her number. Surprise. Yeah. That's pretty cool. Now, if you do that this day and age, you would probably be considered a stalker. Definitely. <laughs> I'd be I like, I'm on the do not call list. I don't know if uh, <laughs> phone phone numbers exist now. Our kids, for example, it's all through the apps. It's Snapchat and whatnot. And, you know, get my snap. I was like, can I just text you? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I don't think they do that anymore. No, I agree. <laughs> um, so... You guys, and I want to talk about your radio career just a yeah. little bit. Um, how long were you doing that? What was that like? I'm sure you got to, it was awesome. uh, I mean, we're not talking Howard Stern, but I'm sure that was a pretty cool experience. Yeah. So uh, for 20 years, I did uh, primarily morning shows around the country. We lived in Alaska, as I mentioned, worked at a country station there, um, worked at a top 40 station in Waco, where I was the uh, morning show host and program director, picked all the songs, yep. wrote the promos. Um, was pretty much responsible for all the staff and staffing and everything. 
Um, had a blast doing that, but in radio, you want to go where there's more money. Sure. And where there's more money is where there's more listeners, so the bigger city. And uh, had an opportunity to go to either Austin or San Antonio. Picked Austin, or I picked San Antonio, I mean, because uh, San Antonio was just going to be all on air, no management role, and all okay. I ever wanted to do was talk on the radio. Yeah. Never, never had anything to do with wanting to manage people, so... Came to town was uh, Jay Charles. That was my radio name on okay. Magic 105.3. And worked with uh, Karen Klaus over there for four years. And uh, at the end of that second two-year contract, they said, uh, hey, we want to talk to you about your contract. And I was like, oh, it's about that time. We need to re, uh, re-negotiate. Yeah. <laughs> and I, was, I knew the economy we was kind of bad. We were building a house at the time as well. Oh. Yeah. No, we, I, well, man, I, I'm not going to argue with her on timelines because, guys, you know <laughs> who's right. I'm not. Yes, dear, you are right. <laughs> anyway, or maybe we had just closed on it. I don't so, know. Uh, so anyway, it was time to renegotiate that contract. This was 2006-ish. Okay. Uh, if you remember what was going on with the world oh, and the economy in it 2006. Was revving up to fall down. Yeah. yeah so it, it, it was, it had already gone bad and I knew advertising uh, revenue was down. I knew everything was bad. I'd always kind of push my salary, but I was like, Hey, I'm not going to be greedy this time. I just want a cost of living raise. That's all 2% over what I'm making. Now I did my little calculation, told my producer, I'm going to go in and get my 2% and I'll be right back. (laughs) And I walked into the office and there was the boss and the boss's boss and the head of HR and everybody with the big fat manila envelope sitting on the on the table Ooh. that anybody who's ever been fired we from know a big what that company. Means. I was going to say, like, uh-oh. And I went, oh. And uh, basically, they broke the news to me. I walked back in my office. My producer said, how'd it go? And I said, not like I expected. <laughs> and I grabbed my stuff and walked out. <laughs> wow. And was that the end of that career? Um, that was the end of that job. Okay. I, it, was the, it was the beginning of the end of that career. Yeah, got a, landed another uh, job worth mentioning in Columbus, Ohio, at the best radio station I'd ever worked with, with a great co-host. It was wonderful. Couldn't wait to get my family moved out to Columbus. Of course, this is mid-recession now. This is 2008-ish, yeah. I believe. Yeah. We're trying to sell our house back in San Antonio on the oh. market for 10 months. Wow. Had not sold, you know, which our is weird. Our mom was a realtor. It was so, so let's talk about that for just a brief moment <laughs> yeah. before we finish up that discussion, sure. because I would like to kind of warp everybody into that mindset and what you guys went through at that point in time. Was it a situation of obviously the market was crashing? Um, not too many people were buying homes at that time, nor were people able to sell homes at that time. Right. But I rest on the idea that in San Antonio or Texas or San Antonio and surrounding that our market didn't really get hit too hard. Was it a situation where the price was too high? You were upside down. What what was that like, if you don't mind? Elisa? I, I mean, it was... Real not talk overpriced. Only. I don't, yeah, it was I don't, not overpriced. It okay. was, I don't believe it was overpriced. I believe in some of the feedback I remember. My mom was our sure. realtor. So I we, we went over all of it all the time. <laughs> we didn't have a fireplace inside. Okay. People didn't like that. Um, we did end up getting one offer, and I think we were starting to negotiate sure. it, and yeah. it was going to... I don't we, It I was a bad we were, time in my I, life. I don't remember. I <laughs> but I do know that... It, it, real estate's come so far. Sure. You know, if I look now at the pictures that they posted of our house. Right. Like, Terrible. I'm like, what yeah. is you know, going on? Every, every, but, every realtor took their own pictures back then. Mm. And, ooh, I had the new $300 digital sure. camera. Yeah. And, and the pictures are dark. They're terrible. They're not nearly as our good as they are Our furniture was now. hideous. I mean. <laughs> in addition, <laughs> your buyer pool was very, very tiny. Mm-hmm. Yeah, in, in a way. I mean, uh, people were losing jobs. You had uh, the economy in disarray. It's funny you ask about that, not being in real estate at the time and looking back at it. I don't think we were ever freaked out like, oh, this is the worst time ever to try to sell a house. Sure. Because at the same time, Texas and San Antonio never being hammered like, right. like other places had been hammered. I'm shopping homes in Columbus, Ohio that had been hammered. Yeah. I had a realtor taking us out. She's like, this one sold two years ago for six hundred. I think you can get it for two eighty five. Wow! This one sold for five hundred. Yeah. I think you guys can get it for three hundred. Mm-hmm. So I'm I'm looking at picking up a bargain on the other end. Sure. All we have to do is get ours sold, and I'm going to pick up yeah. a real Columbus, Ohio gem. Um, because if we look back, I mean, you zoom out on that historical value map, you see that yes, we took a dip from about two thousand and eight, two thousand eleven, but right around two thousand twelve. 
it ticked right back up. Oh, sure. Here in San Antonio. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I was, before I got that Columbus job is when I started dabbling into real estate, not dabbling. I was employed as sure. working work for a new home builder, um, selling homes and shirts. And I okay. remember our sales meetings, they would say, you got to tell people to walk through the door. It's not as bad as the news is telling you. This right. is Texas. This is San Antonio. We are not what the rest of the world has. Um, you know, San Antonio has always been a 2% a year appreciation market. Mm -hmm. This is back in 2006, 2007 and earlier. We didn't have those huge runs, so we shouldn't have those huge drops. Right. And they said, it's just going to take longer to sell your house. And that's what I believed. It's just going to take a little longer to sell our house, um, which is a lot of the kind of advice well, that I gave during the COVID time when things mm -hmm. are running up crazy in yeah. price. Mm -hmm. a and, uh, you know, I just had to fall back on what I believe is the strong fundamentals of real estate of San Antonio yeah. and Texas. And that uh, anybody that lives and owns homes here, I, I feel like you're pretty bulletproof, all things considered. Right, right. You have to be reasonable. You have to uh, obviously work with a professional expert that knows what the heck they're doing. And then the last thing is follow the advice that that expert gives. It does no good to work with an expert if you do the complete opposite every time. Yeah. yeah. Right? Yeah. The, the thing I would say to anybody right now that did buy a home during COVID that might be nervous uh, with what's going on is when you see a real estate market tick up 15 to 20% a year is what San Antonio did right. for those two years. If you pick up a quick 40%, don't be too frustrated if you give back a couple percent. True, Touche, because <laughs> you're not truly, and that's something that I talk about quite often is the actual loss or gain is not realized until you sell. Right. Yeah. So therefore, anytime That's you buy right. real estate, as long as you can hold it, you're I, golden. Ask her every time I look at her 401k and she's like, oh, did you sell a bunch today? I was like, no. It's like, then you didn't lose it. Shut up. That's right. <laughs> Good point. Yeah. Hey, here's the voice of reason bringing yeah. you to reality and uh, letting you know how things work. I'm watch you be sad about the stock market today. Yeah. <laughs> Are and we retiring tomorrow? Cool. <laughs> Uncool if that was the case, but touche. Anyway, touche. Anyway, so, yeah. um, okay, so finishing up the conversation, and we we jumped into yeah, yeah. Uh, a yeah. further conversation down the that. road. But I love it. <laughs> but finishing up your career in radio, how do you think that that helped you moving forward, both family wise and also in your uh, new career? So it was important to me to stay in san antonio okay so fast forward they fired everybody from that got, radio got, station everybody got fired in columbus everybody got we fired hadn't in sold columbus. our house came back home got thank to god keep we the still house. had it i yeah. wanted to keep it so that was great kids got to stay at the school my family lived two miles down the road and my dad was sick mm. very sick so i said I, I think it's time to get a big boy job yeah yeah, yeah. and, and it, just <laughs> that because is the funniest and, thing and, a big boy job. yeah because at that point you knew with radio i was like it's never guaranteed past two years i just we had yeah. kids i was like i don't want to just constantly be fearful of losing my job sure. which is what has happened to most everybody that i used to work with yeah. right and it's just kind of time to retool so i started working for home builders went to work for one that uh, provided great training good sales training how to identify needs and right. wants and how to narrow down to the right floor plan and the right lot and and sell homes and said uh, when i applied for the job and when i accepted the job i said i don't want this job i don't want to sell houses for a living and uh four years later i was a sales manager i was like well i guess i'm pretty good at it i might i might as well just <laughs> embrace it so he now, used to say every time somebody walked into the model home he would say all right I got 30 seconds to make him laugh. He was still treating it I like a radio that. show. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I, That's smart. Yeah, I still like to, uh, to to use humor whenever I can. Well, that being said, my next question has to do with when you were in radio then versus what you see radio now and the censorship and things of that nature. Were you? Did you have less restrictions when you were on the radio? Did they give you the topics? Did you just fly off the cuff? What was that like? I don't think I really, I, I think they get away with more on the radio now because okay. the regulatory bodies are even sure. less funded than they were back then. Ah, so, touche. So there's even less people to give out fines and whatnot. Very different than I, I hear stuff on the radio now. I'm like, can you say that? Like, I could never <laughs> say that. Yeah. Um, but, uh, but to so, answer your question, he talked about whatever he wanted to talk very about. Very cool. Yeah. At, at the Waco job in particular, where I was the boss, that was the most fun. Cause there I, had, you go. I could carte blanche if i wanted to talk about it i could talk about it and, yeah and, uh, less politics stuff yeah, like just, that just my boss trusted me and and uh 
I didn't get us in trouble. <laughs> ah, very good. No, that's that's a smart way to go about it. Saying that saying dirty words on the radio was always a way to get yourself fired, and I always liked that constant paycheck for some reason. <laughs> or to get yourself promoted to WNBC. BC, yes. <laughs> Howard already did that, though. He, yes, he, he did. Everybody else was just copycats after that, so he had to try to figure out something original. And I never figured out what that thing was. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe it was selling homes. Maybe so. <laughs> so now let's talk about about selling of homes. You guys have been doing that for quite some time now, um, have been very successful at it. When you first got into the transition from being a sales counselor to now Realtor, yep. what was that like, that transition of actually having to go out and hunt and uh, uh, kill what you eat versus it's coming to you? Well, first of all, let me say... I didn't want him to do it. She did no. not want scary, me to huh? do it. So scary. Yeah, yeah going... And kids insurance all the mm -hmm. all the things the startup the is 1099 lifestyle mm -hmm. and we'd always been 100 percent commission but right. you always had a company kind of as your backstop of course when you worked for saving a builder. your taxes for you yeah you yeah know? that's true and all that stuff and them supposedly driving traffic through the door but ultimately when i became a sales manager that's when i got to see how many good salesmen had no control of their own destiny because yeah. I'm like, okay, you're our number one sales guy. Aren't you excited? We're going to give you this new community. And if we, as the builder, had not priced it right or put the right product out mm -hmm. there, it wasn't going to it sell. It wasn't going to move. And uh, as a result, because that's what sales organizations do, and if you're a salesman, you know this, eventually they look at your numbers and say, sorry, man, you're just not cutting it. And when they bounce you, and then they bring in somebody yeah, else to starve out. And then after like three sets of sales counselors, they finally figure out, oh, I guess it is us. Yeah, they it's adjust the you, prices, <laughs> and then uh, and I just saw that too many times, and I had been put in that position to where I uh, wanted to control my destiny. I felt like building rapport was always my strong suit. Yeah. Um, and as a realtor, you can go where the client needs you to go, rather than being stuck within the walls of that uh, neighborhood with seven floor plans sure. and pricing from here to here. So when you jumped in, being a little fearful, but excited at the same time, you got your wife on your back saying, you better make this work. <laughs> <laughs> what were you using to get your career jump started? I mean, this is, I, I had just met you when this stuff was yeah. going on. Yeah. I, well, we, if you're, if you're looking for advice for new realtors, absolutely. Um, yeah. my biggest advice then it is now, and I will say, I don't do it nearly as much as we should. Open houses, yeah, because that's uh that's what I did for nine years working for builders. Is people mm -hmm. walk into the front door of the model home and you say, "Hi, how are you? What Absolutely. can I help you with?" And open houses for realtors is just a great way to meet clients. So I think in our first year we had like eight sales uh, that I could trace well, Char back Charlie to did open it by houses. Himself. I didn't. Yeah, at least wasn't a years. realtor yet. And uh, so just going out to open houses, meeting people, shaking hands, asking the questions. Right. Do you have a realtor now? Do you have a house to sell? How can I help you? You know, does this one work? Right. Can I show you another one that might work? And just uh, got to be the guy that's known, liked, and trusted. Absolutely. And as soon as they walk through the door, you got a chance to be known. Then you have uh, an opportunity to make them laugh. Absolutely. And, uh, you know, gain some trust if you talk like you know what you're talking about. That's very true. <laughs> that's very true. It helps. I'll tell you that. And, and I think that is a testament to our current market that we have now where a lot of folks are going back to the basics. But with a skewed understanding, for example, open houses, mm -hmm. there are many realtors out there, lenders out there that believe by doing an open house, number one, it's just a pain in the butt. Um, we're not going to get much from it or I'm not going to sell this house. I think they have a skewed idea of the purpose of an open house. Right. It's intended to meet new people and to yeah. figure out how you can help them yeah. in their path. Um, whereas the... A uh, novice agent goes in and they're like, well, let me try and sell this house. Right. The, the, if you sell go yourself. in with the, yeah. sell yourself. Yeah. That's right. It's uh, an opportunity to col collect phone numbers, email addresses. Absolutely. People, build a sphere, get a bunch of, it's it's just opportunities. Yes. It's not, I'm going to sell this house today. As a matter of fact, we, my wife and I, Kristen, just did an open house uh, for one of your listings. Thank you very and much. It was, yeah. Really? <laughs> yeah. did get a contract. Yeah. <laughs> and I will tell you, our goal was not to sell that house. It yeah. was to meet people. And we had plenty of people come through there, made good relationships, had great conversations. Um, and yes, we would show Made a them really the house. cute video yeah, you guys yeah. did. Yeah. It, it, we showed them the house. Kristen knew all the details yeah. of it, but it was just to impress them that she knows what the hell she's doing. Yeah. It's not uh, to sell this house in particular. 
it's to earn their trust, mm -hmm. their like, uh, and and uh, get them to understand that I can help you do whatever it is that you're trying to accomplish. Yeah. There is one case though, and I'm thinking there might have been another. We did sell the house at the that open house. That has happened before. Where Me too. That's someone, awesome someone feeling. got there and and you know they're walking around like it's even more beautiful than we hoped, and we're like, <laughs> whoa, have you seen this before? <laughs> no, it's our first time. Do you have a realtor? No. Nope. <laughs> Bingo. <laughs> Boom. Jackpot, baby. <laughs> That's awesome. So now that being said, do you guys ever play both sides of the fence? Meaning let's split you up. You go to your corner. You go to your corner. I'm going to be the listing. I'm going to be the buying. We have. We okay. Have. Yeah. It's not my favorite. No. I, yeah. And I've heard that quite often that you don't want to uh, blur the lines, the fiduciary responsibilities to this person or that right. person. Um, would you compare that to maybe a builder and their lender? <laughs> okay. uh, I don't think there's any uh, any mystery that builders and their lenders are like that. <laughs> when Elisa and I are representing yeah. opposite sides, we are at least like that. We get kind of close down, to, yes. you know, when we get home. But uh, um, and yeah. they call that what an intermediary, correct? It's intermediary. Yes. Okay, yeah. very good. With appointment, sure, sure. With appointment, <laughs> <laughs> that's awesome. That's awesome. But uh, yeah, it, it's a it's a weird one because we like to negotiate hard, and uh, it, it was kind of a. a different deal we've had a thing where two neighbors that more or less knew each other already we right. helped them but um yeah it doesn't happen very often i always usually say it you know there's fifteen thousand agents in san antonio the odds of us working a buyer and seller are pretty small slim. yeah very slim it it did happen when at, the, at an open house i remember mm -hmm. they came in they wanted to buy it we have the listing and we got somebody from the office. Yeah, we did that in one case also. Because it's mm -hmm. just, it was just, I was so new that I was like, I don't know what I don't feel say. comfortable doing yeah. this. Yeah. yeah. And that makes perfect sense. I mean, so in, in today's market, um, we're hearing a lot of chatter out there about crashes. We've already addressed the fact that you believe that uh, we're not going to crash. We're in a pretty good spot being here in Texas. But how are you keeping up with um, the numbers that you put up last year? year before i mean what are you what we're speaking truth here i mean let's give Not. the folks realistic expectations of what's going on are we talking to realtors right now Is by that all our means audience? we're talking to anybody that'll listen to this <laughs> um my i bet my mom does yeah <laughs> my personal expectation for 2023 is that we will sell more homes than we did in 2022 okay i feel like we we started out we're in a coaching program where we have to define our goals um by January 15, we were already redefining quarter one goals because we'd already hit them. Sure. Had an incredible December when the rates dropped, dropped just for a, a moment. little yeah. bit. Sure. We had picked up a bunch of referrals and, and uh, got a lot of people under contract in a hurry in December. But then I noticed come mid-February, I'm like, where's the new contract? Yeah. Like, uh, you know, you, it, it's kind of, you know, it's even personally cyclical. Right. But um, there's an awful lot of demand. Yesterday I went... I took a piece of paper and wrote through all the buyers and sellers that we're constant that we're currently communicating with. Mm -hmm. I think we've got like twenty three to twenty five active. Like if the right home would just present itself, and Absolutely. we've been in that case for two years, which is more proof that I feel we're in a uh, uh, seller's market still. Not enough homes on the market because I've had multiple uh, million dollar buyers right. who are like. Show me the right house. And I'll pull the trigger. Yeah. yeah. And and they're ready tomorrow. And, or they're ready yesterday. Yeah. And we just can't find the right house for sure. them. Sure. And by definition, a seller's market converts to a buyer's market once we have at least six months of inventory mm -hmm. sitting on the market, which makes perfect sense as to why. But a lot of folks are calling it a buyer's market prematurely, but not understanding it's, the actual facts that go into that. It's not statistically a buyer's market right now, though we are getting more concessions for our yes, buyers than yes. we've gotten in a long time. More yeah. willing to negotiate, more willing to come to the terms that, yes, this inflated price that you uh, value your home yeah. at is just that. It's a little inflated. Let's bring it down to reality if your goal is to get it sold. Right. I, I was super excited when the market softened a little bit because it was just so hard. It I, was. I, again, I, I tell our buyer clients this. I like it when it's buyer versus seller, mm -hmm. not buyer versus buyer. Right. It's like, I want to go beat that homeowner up to get you a deal, not just figure out what do we have to do to beat this other buyer's contract. Yeah. You know, where the seller doesn't even really matter. You're competing against the other nine yeah. offers on the sure. table. Yeah. Sure. So to go back to being able to uh, negotiate against the seller was exciting but now we just need the houses. Yeah. That's still where we're at. I feel right. like we just don't have enough good, uh, well, right-priced 
inventory out there. I agree. And I mean, probably including us and every lender out there has a stack of pre-approved buyers yeah. uh, ready to go pull the trigger on, but the inventory in those price range yeah. are very slim. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that too. I mean, we're, we're still, you're still seeing multiple offers on rightly priced homes. I, I've I said agree it. With that. Yeah. We, we have buyers for the last four weekends in a row that have gone into multiple offer situations. Right. Um, now, fortunately, there's some of the ones that need closing costs, and I'm like, yeah. that's not going to happen on the first weekend right. out of the out of the gate. Now, how do you advise a client in those situations when they do need a little bit of help from the sellers, um, and they're wanting a home pretty quickly? <laughs> Don't look at me, because <laughs> well, I say I tell people, let's then let's look at the houses that have been on the market thirty five days. Smart, yeah. very but, smart. I, yes. I, don't call me when a brand new house comes on the market that there's a line around the corner to see if you need ten thousand dollars in closing assistance, right. unless you're willing to go twenty five thousand dollars over. Over, yes, and then ask for it back. Yeah, but... so let's go look at the houses. Well, we'll all we'll always take somebody out to see a house. It's not a don't call me situation. Oh, for sure, for sure. It's a don't it, don't. Get your expectations us, but we're going to yeah. set the right expectations mm -hmm. that that's probably not going to be a winning play for you. Yeah. Um, and with that being said, um, I mean, you've got a lot of folks out there I that think 15 days is the magic number. Personally, yeah. two weekends, if that home's gone through two weekends by then the sellers get nervous and then they need to make yeah. an adjustment. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I'm happy to make that adjustment for them if they're not, <laughs> if them and their agent aren't going to do that. I have never been shy about. And, and hey, that all I, they can say is no. And that I think is what separates you guys from being top producers versus others that are been in the business a while, um, not selling as much. They're not able to have what I call the conversation. Yeah. Well, we were in a house. Uh, I was in a house with somebody just last week, priced at four fifteen. We've got what's called the, uh, I always describe it as the Zillow Zestimate for Realtors. It's an app that you have to be in San Antonio Board of Realtors to get okay. to. Um, I pulled up the house, looked at the value. It was 385 They had it at 410 I was like, how would you like this home at 385 And she's like, I'd like it a lot more. Yeah. I was like, would you buy it at 385 And those are the conversations that I think a lot of realtors are just afraid to have. They, they don't. It's not a closing. You're trying to help your client get right. something that they like at a price they like. And I think... The reason behind that, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, is they don't know how to back it up with the education and the facts behind it. Paint the picture. Here's the presentation. And here's why I came up to that conclusion. And mm -hmm. this is why I'm giving you this advice. You said, hey, you want to sell this house. Well, if that is the case, this is what it's going to take. And here's why. Yeah. Um, I believe you guys being educated and love what you do have the ability to have the tools necessary to go... Here you go. Right. This yeah. is why. Yeah, we're going to support the evidence when we put the offer in at 385. We're going to say, here's the four neighbors that just like your home that yeah. sold at 385. And, you know, here's your opportunity to sell your house. Absolutely. You want to take it up? Take Absolutely. us up on it? <laughs> That's so true. So now let's pivot a little bit to the idea of renting, killing wealth. Mm. That's I, his favorite I, I, topic. Love, I love this conversation <laughs> um, because many reasons. Uh, I've made some good money in my life, but I will tell you that money came and went, but the properties that uh -huh. we purchased continued to build. Mm -hmm. So if I had to attribute anything of uh, Kristen and I's wealth, so to speak, we're not there yet, but by all means, we're, we're, Working we're, on we're, it. we're skipping rocks, dang it. <laughs> <laughs> um, it has to do with buying real estate and holding on to it, selling it at the right time, putting uh, investment properties in, flipping pro All of those things have to revolve around renting, uh, I'm sorry, property. And it all started with one. Right. Well, I don't, uh, do, you, do you want to say something? Because you know I always do. <laughs> you, you go right on ahead because I have an unpopular, you know I have an unpopular yeah, she does opinion. Have, no, and, no. As, as a realtor, I have an unpopular she opinion. She has an unpopular opinion in our family. Okay. No, as a realtor. Well, let, let me let me jump jump in. I'll go ahead and do my talking, and then He's you can good. rebut it and squash him. My thing about uh, renting kills wealth. What I'm saying is, I don't think everybody needs to go out and get into syndication and have thirty doors. It's great if you want to pursue that. Sure. Um, but I think it all starts with owning one door, the one you're living in, yes. as opposed to renting the one you're living in. Um, I wish I remembered a statistic I saw just this last week. I think the average homeowners net worth in America 
If you own a home, statistically, you have about $153,000 in net worth. The average renter has something like six grand yeah. in net worth. Correct. And it's just simply you building equity every time you make a payment mm -hmm. and the fact that your home should appreciate right. over time. Um, as long as you take and those, care of it. And those right. are the things. So the examples I give and why it's so personal to me, my dad never owned. My dad never he owned a house. He told us not to buy a house. Yeah. My dad. And there's a lot of folks out there like that. My, there, are, there are folks out there that will say, I'm going to try and buy an investment property, but yet I'm still renting. Yeah. And when they come to me for that, I have to kind of like, okay, let's pause for a second. Take 15 steps backwards and let me show you how this kind of works. You're literally going to buy an investment property so that you can pay your rent. Yeah. yeah. I don't get it. Yeah. <laughs> But my dad rented his whole life pretty, I was a single child, pretty much the only money he left when he You're passed. You're only child? Believe it or not. I do believe it now. <laughs> when my dad passed away, the Kristen only, money, too. The only money he left me was the money he had inherited from his parents who owned a home ah. and always had owned their homes. And then my mom, when she uh, left Kansas to come down to San Antonio, um, she was living in an apartment. I said, mom, how much money do you have in the bank? She told me how much she had. She was renting uh, in Bernie, an apartment complex. And I said- you have exactly 19 months worth of money of rent checks mm -hmm. in your account. Mm -hmm. And she wasn't working. She had her right. social security. I said, we can take those 19 months right now and go buy a house. Right. And she did bought it out outright cash. And, uh, luckily she did. Cause otherwise I think the apartment complex just would have sucked her dry. dry. She, she would have had to live with us. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that was awesome. Anyway, let me let me tee up Elisa for her unpopular opinion. That was because so sincere and heartfelt. As a realtor, you see and you understand how much wealth can be built uh, renting, buying homes to rent to others. Yes. And there's a market for that. I, I do understand that sometimes buying is not the perfect situation. However, I was we were in an in a position to be able to buy one of these homes. Mm -hmm. And uh, there was a neighborhood near our home that I was like, these are great. It's Bernie Schools. Most affordable price homes in town. I think we should buy this one. And her take is? We're in the business of helping people achieve the American dream. Okay. I am not going to go buy a house that these newlyweds really want to buy. Okay. Because I can get the commission taken off or I know better than them. I, I'm going to help them first. Okay. I like to live a life of abundance. I say that. Sure. There's plenty to go around. I'm not against, we have a rental property now, so I'm yeah. not, but when I go to these conferences or such with Charlie and we've got these agents up there, and I own 68 doors and you know, I just went in and I just bought all those cheap houses up because I could. And I'm just thinking, what about all those families? We're going to sit right here and we're going to say renting kills wealth, right? but then we're going to go buy all the houses okay. and rent I, them I, to I, you? I, I can appreciate that perspective. I really can because that comes from a place of um, goodness. That's who it defines who you are as a person. Um, but the alternative is you've got a company called BlackRock that'll come in and well, buy it with zero yes, remorse and exactly. only look at the bottom line. Right. And on the other token, you've got a sea of renters that need to rent. Well, not even that. It's more so. They're naysayers about buying. Sure. They're the ones that are on the comments going, yeah, the market's going to crash. And you're like, just keep renting. Exactly. <laughs> so let me just keep burning this money up. Yeah. Um, and I think it's more of a situation where you have to get in where you fit in um, versus missing opportunities that you guys put yourself in a position to be able to do that. If anything, I would say go on a road show and explain and show people how you did it. And that's more of an educational piece for those folks. Like you said, start with one. Mm -hmm. You mm -hmm. got to start with one. Well, and she never wanted to, the, you know, chase down rent and all the, of get the call in the middle of the night that the toilet's backed up and yep. all that. So uh, finally, we did get our first investment property when our daughter got a job <laughs> in Oklahoma there City. And she said, hey. I've got a great renter. Do you want to buy a home in Oklahoma City? <laughs> so is she, is she not in my backyarded? And we took a house off the market in Oklahoma City with it. We rent to our daughter. Which now, is, believe it or not, <laughs> Oklahoma, and I was reading a report. So gosh, I was literally so just going to say that. You should see it this is, house. It it's is so going awesome. to be the new place in time. Obviously, everything is it. over time where you're going to find affordable housing um, that is totally reasonable for your first time home buyers. And it, 
takes me to the situation of, okay, there's a lot of first time home buyers sitting on the fence because there's not enough inventory available for them. So what happened in California when the prices were low? People had to start moving out and migrating to be able to do that. I'm trying to get the point across to the renters out there that you can't consistently live this fake lifestyle, meaning I want to live near Lock and Terra and the house is there, 500, 600,000. So I'm going to rent at this astronomically high rent price so that I can fake the funk is what I like to call mm-hmm. it. <laughs> <laughs> and, and the idea behind that is how do we get through to these folks so that they understand themselves that you've got to bring yourself down to the real reality and stop living this fake, um, you're doing it for the wrong reasons type situation. Does that kind of make sense? Yeah, Yeah, I I think it's just either you understand it and you want to be a homeowner Mm -hmm. or it's not important to you. Because when I was selling homes, uh, new homes in the model, I used to always have a lot of couples in their mid-20s that would come in, they'd find out the monthly payment, Oh, I don't want to be house poor. Mm-hmm. I don't want to be house poor. I don't want to be house poor. And I'd say, hey, we're all house poor. I'd say, you know, uh, don't you remember when we got married, you start having kids, and then your Friday night fun was sitting out in the street with a yep. cooler of beer, watching the kids ride trikes out right. in the street. That became your Friday night instead of going and dropping 200 bucks on a movie a and dinner. or anything else. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. Fun became you guys bring the burgers, you guys bring the uh, buns. Yes. Uh, I'll bring the beer, meet me on the back porch, and we'll all have a cookout with all our neighbors who are equally house yes. poor. Yeah. And this is and those li- are your this, best friends at the yeah, time. This is literally a conversation that I have just about every day. I, I started producing again to help everybody out, and I, I'm loving it. I fell in love with yeah. it again. Yeah. Um, and we were on a call the other night that almost made me cry because it's like these people are so deserving. They're buying out in Hondo. Um, prices are lower, things of that nature. So they can get into a home, and they understand the value of doing Good. so. So the idea of most of the San Antonio folks that are renting, they want to continue to stay in that upper echelon price range, but not realistically be able to qualify for it. Um, It's not to the point of there's not affordable housing. Well, no, there's not affordable housing where you want to buy. Are you going to come to terms with that? Or are you going to start moving outwards? Because in any metropolitan area, if you just take a couple of miles outward, you're going to find some affordable pricing. Mm-hmm. Is it going to be, um, I don't know, great for your commute? Is it great for your what you used to go and do? Maybe not, but it is a reward at the end for your family, for you financially. Um, and just like you said, as first-time home buyers, they need to understand that your habits start to change. Your lifestyle tra- starts to change. Instead of going out to the clubs or the bars or whatever, you tend to have people over. Mm -hmm. And now it becomes uh, this warm place where everybody starts to make memories. And you get to show off that home you bought. Exactly. You uh, you get to say, come to my house. That's so true and and so cool at the same time because people want to believe that I have to have all these great things and people are going to judge me if I don't versus... You've got your friends that are probably all renting still coming over to your house and judging you for whatever the case. Well, right. Dumbass, you're still renting. Right. Yeah. So the house that our daughter rents from us, she's only 24. Yeah. It's out in the suburbs. It's 25 minutes away from her work. It's nowhere near any of the fun stuff. Mm-hmm. But she doesn't care. Right. Because she's got a house to live in. She's not throwing away money on rent. Right. I mean, she is renting from us. But, but still, yes. It's it's a different situation but she finds great joy in mm-hmm. having people over yeah come over come over to my house we'll have we'll cook we'll do this we'll do that and i think she, being her age and already living the i have a home lifestyle yeah. she's gonna continue with that i have to oh, agree yeah. Yeah. yeah and you know where she got that from right she's already, both she's already, of you. She's already I mean, that's a she's, joint effort she's already asking like if me and my boyfriend make this much combined, how much home do you think we could afford? I was like, you're not moving out. I like good tenants. I'll lower the rent before I have you move out. <laughs> now, this is not the one that's French, right? Uh, the yes. boyfriend is French, yes. Okay. yes. <laughs> I don't want him to get offended. No, no, no. I'll, I will definitely yeah, that's sell right. him. <laughs> that's awesome. No, that's great. Uh, home ownership is fantastic. I appreciate Elisa's big heart because it has been difficult getting some first-time home buyers into homes and if you're a first time home buyer who keeps getting your teeth kicked in, hang in there. Keep smiling. We yeah. love your smile even though you don't have any teeth. Yeah. 
<laughs> yeah. It's so true. Now, I love first time home buyers. They're they're probably my favorite. Yeah. Now, as long as their dad stays home. Uh, touche. Touche. <laughs> Don't you bring dad to that inspection. <laughs> it's like you're not buying the house, nor did you build it. <laughs> it's true. We get a lot of folks. And now most of the time I will um, invite the parents to the conversation um, so that they give their two cents, especially in today's market, simply because the parents, and I, I said this before, um, as far as advice goes, what advice would you give to a first time buyer? Talk to your parents. I well, don't normally true. say that <laughs> because in the previous market, it was always a different kind of conversation. Now it's more so ask your parents what rate they paid on their house. Yeah. Yes. And then ask them how much they made when they sold that first house. Yeah. And that way it's a true and factual statement that they can provide their expertise mm -hmm. because they've gone through it. Yeah. Um, they either have sold and made good money or they still live in that house. It's probably paid off yeah. or it's been paid off and they pulled money out to pay for college and it, backwards and forwards. Mm -hmm. But it is a um, mechanism for financial gain. And it's also nice, especially like if I went to my mom and said, hey, what did you and dad pay? Yeah, what was your interest rate on that house in St. Mm -hmm. Louis? Oh, what was that? 1984, 16%? Uh, yeah. It's nice to be able to say we're still historically low. Absolutely. Yeah. Yes. And that's a big conversation that just about every lender, every realtor is talking about right now. Um, but unfortunately, people are getting discouraged both on the lending side and the real estate side. Um, I'm seeing a lot of folks getting out of the business. Really? Uh, I believe the statistic that we looked up is 40% of lenders nationally did not re renew their license. Wow. wow. That's a big number. But there are but, a lot of mom and pops and little onesie twosies, aren't there? I would imagine so. Um, so, yes, that being said, I can almost bet that that's probably the case. Right. Um, but it's a situation of, did we have too many anyway? Sure. <laughs> yeah. I was at, a, I was at a, a lunch with a bunch of top producing realtors. And this, this woman, <laughs> she's been doing this forever. Like when my mom was a realtor, they were friends. Yeah. And she says... I'm glad that the market's doing this because you, we need to get rid of some of these newbies. They they think they can do this part time and, and they're they're making our profession look bad. Yeah, I, I'm I'm happy to see them go. Well, there is something to be said for the the old adage of Do you want to? Uh, real estate is not brain surgery, but would you want a brain surgeon that does two operations a year, touche, or two a day? I don't think I've ever heard it. Um, articulated that yeah. way and that is a great way to <laughs> yeah. put it because you're using something that um that's detrimental or advantageous to your health and what could happen same situation with a home i'm gonna break <laughs> it to you mark i don't know if you've ever known this but you had brains realtors <laughs> realtors have a negative connotation with some people yeah yeah some people don't like yeah. us Oh, you'd heard that? I have heard that. I've heard that. <laughs> anyway. It was written on a bathroom stall or something. <laughs> I believe that. Anyway, I think it's those uh, those part-time agents that just don't have the knowledge. They just haven't been through enough transactions, or and they're self-centered because they're like, oh, I haven't gotten paid in a long, long sure. time. I got to get this deal closed no matter what. Right. You know, when, when you finally have enough success and enough pipeline that you can tell someone, and, and I just never forget... Um, when you tell a client, this is not the house for you. Mm -hmm. When they're like, I want to I want to own this home. And you're like, this is not a good house. Right. Don't buy this house, please. Because it's a flip job or whatever. You Like, I just think there's something wrong with it right. that you don't know. Just my spidey sense is talking. And I remember because we passed on one. We got her closed on another home. She was a lawyer and she figured out how to dig into city records. Mm. And there was like open, uh, open permits and all kinds of sure. stuff on this property she's like oh my god i'm so glad i didn't buy that house thank you thank you thank you yeah and uh <laughs> but uh anyway you got to be able to tell a client this isn't the right one for you and and just realize that uh you, you always got to put them first well it, it is another testament to the um and i i almost don't want to use the word expert anymore as i move forward because there's a lot of folks throwing around the word expert um but they may be part-time, they may have had to get another job through this tough time in our market to where our all sales are going down. Whereas me, you guys, we know it's a tough market. What are we going to do? We're going to dig deeper. We're going to call more people. We're going to shake more hands. We're going to kiss more babies. <laughs> We're going to do what it takes because this is our career path. We've chosen it. Um, 
what is it the, the this game didn't choose. I didn't choose this game. Right. It chose me. <laughs> That's right. That's right. Yeah. You know, and and it means a whole lot when you have a realtor that is working on your side that has the confidence, the um, wherewithal to be able to say, "Hey, this is not for you. I'm not going to benefit from this in the financial gain right now, but I will in the long run because I'm putting you in the right place for you to succeed down the road." Yeah. Whereas you've got folks that are taking listing all over the place because the seller says, I believe it's worth this much and they don't want to lose the listing or the opportunity. So they take the listing and then it sits on the market. Right. Yeah. And if that's the case, I always, uh, when we're working on the listing side, I tell them, listen, this is your money. I never want to leave any of it on the table. Mm -hmm. You know, here's what I feel the value is. I understand you think it's a little bit higher. Let's go for it. Right. Never know. Yeah. Just to understand I will know within 20 days. And that, that's what I was going to ask. Do you give a parameter or a time frame? I like, like to. All right, we're going to go with yours, even though the comp showed this. But at a certain point, he if like, you're going to hire me. I like to. because he, like, he likes to try to put them on a program. Okay. Yeah, just yeah. to take the emotions out of it. Yeah. Because it really is hard w- when a home doesn't sell. I think sellers take it personally. And they think, oh, my realtor's doing a bad job for me. And mm-hmm. if you can set those defined points ahead of time, it takes the... What do we say now? Do we say 15 days or 20 days before a price reduction? Right. If you can get them written out ahead of time, I think it it takes the it takes the emotion out, and it just you know also just makes it predictable. You can almost just say, "Hey, I made that cha- price adjustment that we agreed to mm-hmm. three weeks ago." In addition, it solidifies your level of expertise. Yeah, it really does. It, Thank it you. it's confirmation of you're the expert. Right. You know. Um, so that's some good information and I'm sure, yeah, go ahead. I, I'm just going to say that program works better than the, I told you so, yeah. I told you so. <laughs> yeah, they don't true. like it when you do that. No, no. no. weird. <laughs> that's awesome. So that's some great information for the listeners. I'm sure there's plenty of folks that will grab nuggets out of this or they won't, whatever. Uh, we're just here to, 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 to spill it out. Yeah. Um, but as you guys progressed in your career, became top producers, what do you feel you do that helps others that doesn't have to do with real estate? It, it's more so a giving back community spirit. Uh, uh, I don't know whether it's de- uh, devoting your time or um, uh, donating. I don't know. I know what we like to do, community type service, things of that nature. And it's not only when the market's good do we do right. these types of yeah. things. Right. Uh, we do a lot of work with a, a organization in Bernie called the Hill Country Daily Bread. We volunteer there um, at least monthly. Mm-hmm. We also mentor a family that uses That's their been services. So fun. It's been awesome. Yeah. Um, Charlie's very involved at our church. Um, I try. You know, there's so many. No, guys, you either do or you don't. Well, there's yeah. so many and people that are more, and you're like, I want to be like that guy someday. And then, and then I'm you like, find oh, out yeah, he's retired. I'm yeah. still work. <laughs> there's yeah. so many people who do nothing. So, so it, you know, it is. But I think for us, for me, I want to help people. That's yeah. all. That's all I ever want to do. Uh, my background's in customer service. It's what, what you have a problem. How can I fix it? She yeah. It, it, it doesn't have to be selling you a house. You right. don't, you don't know where to buy balloons for your kid's birthday party. Come on. I'm going to show you. It's, it's all about what can, what, what can, how can we help you reach your goal? She's yeah. the ultimate nurturer. I don't remember what that personality type is, but it's the, <laughs> Me it's, neither. It's, it's the one that makes it where I don't ever have to make my own lunch. Or dinner, That's or awesome. fold my clothes, yeah. or uh, anything. And she doesn't get mad at me. That's awesome. <laughs> no, it is. Whatever and, that personality type is. I, and what it I ends up one. doing, in my opinion, from my point of view, is it turns you guys into not just real estate experts. It turns you into a resource for your community and those that um, seek anything under the sun. Why? Because through your career, you've built relationships with different trades, with different um probably companies with different people things of that nature so when you advertise you don't have to just advertise real estate i'm here to help you Mm -hmm. whatever that may be if i can't i can at least guide you to who can you can be a connector there you go Mm -hmm. yeah the source of the source yeah as as famous marcus laffey says (laughs) you're the source of the source that's that's a good one (laughs) good old marcus laffey shout out man (laughs) we finally got him on (laughs) that's awesome that's awesome so um we've gone almost an hour 
What I about think. pickleball? We, you asked what our passions I, are. I'm, what getting about ready pickleball? To, I'm getting ready to get into that. Every day I, he's pickling. I got to save the pickle for the end. <laughs> <laughs> That's the good stuff. That's what he said. That is what I just said. <laughs> <laughs> so tell me, guys. Um, I have played pickleball one time. Didn't really understand it, but I'm athletic, so I was like, I'm good at this. <laughs> and I'm sure you were. <laughs> I wasn't bad. Yeah. But how did you get into that? Where Where did that come from, and how do you... Keep yourself engaged in something like that. Okay. Because well, they're Charlie, popping up everywhere. everywhere. Yeah. Charlie, Fastest growing sport in America. <laughs> don't get left behind. Uh, he, Charlie has had a passion for racket sports his whole life. Okay. So ever, I mean, since I've known Charlie, racquetball and tennis, mostly racquetball when we first met. Racquetball was the way to go. And then tennis once in a while. But then when pickleball started, because I, ne- I played tennis with them maybe Six times. Okay. And I was okay. like, I don't like doing this. Like, I look good in a skirt. No, I don't. Be good over here. <laughs> <laughs> but so when he said, oh, I'm, we're going, we're joining the club again because they got pickleball courts and I want to play pickleball. So I went up there and I learned, I'm not very good at it, but it's, it's fun. Yeah. It's fun. That's why I like it. It's, it's not, there's no pressure. Right. Unless you're playing at his level. <laughs> but when I've gone up there and played with the couple of women or my sister or whatever, it's, it's fun. Yeah. It's a it's a great sport. If you have played racket sports, you're going to take to it immediately. Okay. Even if ping pong's your only mm-hmm. racket sport, um, but for those that don't call themselves racket sports enthusiasts, it's a game you could just pick up and start playing. It's it's a very equalizing sport because the ball is a wiffle ball, so it only moves so fast. Sure. Um, the rules are kind of designed so that the point naturally has to start. Okay. You serve the ball, they hit it back. The server has to let it bounce, <laughs> and that gives like the whole game a chance for it to become equalized like right both sides it's uh you only score if you're serving i don't know it's a great sport that's awesome give me a holler i'll teach you how to play i need to i'll hold a clinic mark mark, mark and i'll do his thing of chicken game. pickle we'll, that sounds we'll good book a court and anybody that wants to learn to play pickleball that's awesome I, i'm totally game i by am the too way. so the idea of you just oh, gotta get, get in the comments it. it's happening you just gotta get in the comments get, i'll organize it yeah, I, won't, she'll I, won't, organize. I won't make you p- kiss it like i do with my kids <laughs> thank you <laughs> <laughs> Since we're talking about pickles. <laughs> but uh, anyway, it's just a great sport. It is so much fun. And literally, it's all I think about. <laughs> that's awesome. No, well, that's no. If hobby. any of our clients are watching, he's thinking about you first. Yes. Then pickleball. Yes. He's, how can I hurry up and finish helping them so I can go play pickleball? There you go. <laughs> the right way. It's good to have a healthy balance between work and pleasure. And pickleball is the yeah. pleasure part of my life. That's pretty cool. Along You've with sitting on, the, sitting on the couch next to her, drinking wine at night, laughing, watching TV. Yes. She's my best friend. Oh, uh, <laughs> guys. <laughs> <laughs> so you guys playing pickleball. Has that been something that you can leverage to meeting clients, new people? Um, is it more like a pickup game situation? Or are you going out there like shirts and blouses? What, what's the deal? <laughs> We've got a, uh, I'm on a group text with a bunch of guys who live around us, 18 guys that are just like, hey, wow, anybody available group. tomorrow at two? You know, and if we can put together four people to play uh, doubles, that'll be great. Um, she and I play. We got her sister and my brother in law to playing. We've got, uh, but to answer a your nephew, question, Mark, kids play. we live in an area where maybe every other house has a realtor living in it. Sure, that's true. <laughs> that's true. Fair Oaks Ranch, Fair Oaks, Texas, and they all also play pickleball. Ah, so I'm not sure we're leveraging it too much for our business, sure. but we certainly are networking with other agents. That's a great way, yeah, because everybody knows somebody that knows somebody. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yep. so true. Yeah, yeah. It's uh every week my coach asks me. My real estate coach, not a pickleball coach. <laughs> we re- haven't gotten awesome. to that level yet. My real That'd estate awesome. coach asks, how many conversations have you had with people? Mm-hmm. And I'm always able to count those people up and inflate my number thanks to That's, pickleball. Uh, there you go. <laughs> there you go. And, and and it's all about leveraging what you do that you love to do. Yeah. Um, it, it's totally having to get uncomfortable when those things become habit. I mean, do you just... What, let them go by the wayside? No, you you start to leverage that thing and it makes you even more in, enthralled in yeah. whatever that extracurricular may be. Yeah. Even if it's just drinking wine with buddies <laughs> or your wife, you know? <laughs> I like that. I like that. Well, I mean, it's been a fantastic discussion. I'm glad I finally got you guys on. It was awesome, Mark. Thank yeah. you. Yeah. 
Is there anything that you guys would like to leave our listeners with, whether it may be real estate advice, whether it be um, life advice, or even just something you want to talk shit about? I want to pick your brain, actually. Go can ahead. you give me just a second? You can have all the time you want. All the statistics show that when a country goes into, when America has gone into past recessions, yeah. interest rates have come down. Yes. I think statistically, we are going to be entering a recession nationally. I agree. One that I don't think is going to have a lot of impact on Texas. I agree. But when are those interest rates going to come down in your It's a opinion? great, great conversation. I've got my theory. I want to. And, and I, I study this as much as one mm -hmm. can study sure. it without being in the in crowd. And I'm talking the in crowd, the ones that pulls the levers and the strings. Yeah. Okay. Uh -huh. So I have to use basic um, logic with this. Our consumer pricing index is still through the roof. The only mechanism that is out there in order to control our CPI is rates. Mm -hmm. The rate that the Fed lends to the banks. The banks then lend out those funds to mortgage bankers, and then we more lend those funds to uh, normal consumers. Mm -hmm. Every single person in that chain has to make some money or else they wouldn't be doing it. Right. I think that we started raising that lever way too slow. We the raised Fed. it in the Fed. They, okay. in, they raised it incrementally way too slow. I think it should have been pretty quick, drastic increase in rates and it would have shocked the hell out of people. Um, but since we haven't, it has allowed folks to continue to spend, mm -hmm. continue to, um, I don't know, create this alternate world that is not reality. And they started using credit like a son of a gun. And in my opinion, this recession that we're going to have is going to be pretty hard. It's not going to be hard really? on Texas. Okay. I don't believe it's going to be hard on Texas, your Florida's. Um, I don't think that's political either. I just think that Texas has the most affordable housing. Florida, similar to that, unless you're talking to the beach and all that. But the idea behind how we get rates to come back down is stop spending so much damn money. And then our consumer pricing index will start dropping again. Mm-hmm. But then we also have the auto industry where for the past three years, people were able to buy cars at 120, 130, 140, 150% of the actual value. You fast forward two, three years. Well, if you got car problems, if you've got a situation to where you, you don't even like the car anymore, whatever reason it may be, and then you go and check what its value is, similar to homes back in the day, mm -hmm. you go, whoa, I'm upside down in my car. Is that because people were paying over... Absolutely. Sticker price for Absolutely. cars, which, which due to the shortage, I, I mean, knew was I happening. I was one of them. I bought a Bronco for 150,000 or 150% of its value. I didn't like it. So I went, okay, let me dump this thing. I lost 10 grand right, right out the gates. I think I held it for maybe two and a half months. I just didn't like it. Yeah. Luckily, I was able to get rid of it when I did because it would have been an even bigger loss. Um, but you've got a lot of folks out there that have a overinflated price with a low interest rate, mind mm -hmm. you, because they were lower. And I don't think folks took advantage of the low interest rates as much as they should have the first time buyers. Um, and you also have the fact that these folks, um, they're not grasping the concept of what it takes to bring that CPI down. Okay. It's it just as a whole. But you're you're talking ahead. about the Fed? Is that those folks? No, the or Fed. Are you talking the, about the people Fed, that bought cars at too high of a the, price? The, those <laughs> kind of folks. The first time home buyers. Um, this is when the, the wealthy get even more wealthy. Why? Because the folks that are in a tough spot that have a brain, they start to sell off things so they can continue. They don't want to mess up their credit. Right. Um, and they end up having to sell it at a discount. Who ends up buying it? The people that have money. Bottom line. Right? Sure. So that doesn't really affect our economy yet. Because they were already wealthy. Doesn't put it back into the market. It just gives the money to the people that needed it at the time to get them to the next month and to the next month. Until we get rocked, mm -hmm. so to speak, um, we're not going to see any kind of change. And if they continue to incrementally increase this, we're also not. And it's just going to make it worse. I think the Fed needs to raise the rate by damn near half a point the next time they do it. And then we're going to go, whoa, okay, maybe we should stop. Yeah. Not stop everything but by all means let's slow down big time will it affect our real estate market it absolutely is it already has um but you know how you have uh, a band-aid and you try and 
peel it off yeah. real slow and it's like, ah, this is excruciating. And then somebody wise comes across and goes <laughs> and rips that sun gun off <laughs> and you go, okay, that's, it's done. That's what needs to happen. So you think instead of two quarter points, they need to do one half point, yeah. let it simmer. Yep. I do. And, and, and it's going to hurt, but it will accomplish or at least have a better opportunity of accomplishing what the goal is, which is to bring that sucker down. Right. Yeah. Brings me back to my question that I've asked since last June, Mm -hmm. about when rates started going up crazy and the Mm -hmm. market started slowing down a lot. Oh, yeah. Where's all the cash buyers from 2021 Mm -hmm. when 49% of Bear County homes sold to cash buyers? Right. Where are they now? They were all investors and they're out of money. Yeah. They bought them all. Okay. They bought them all. um, And unfortunately, fortunately, it gives the opportunity to the first time buyer to jump back in the market, kind of like you were alluding to. They just need to understand that this is a temporary situation regarding your payment. If right. you are able to afford the payment, great. In a year, two years, when rates start trickling back down, you're going to have a better position. That's what we say. Date the rate, marry the house. Yeah, I mean, that. it's a great point. Um, but a lot of folks don't understand it. Why? Because they are not willing to accept that during the last three to two to three years, that was totally a a <laughs> fake market. It, right. it, we were getting free money. You should have taken advantage of it when you had it because your three hundred thousand dollar price point that you were looking at is now two twenty. Unfortunately. Yeah. Come for the to same, terms for with the same it. Monthly throw payment. your hat correct. Yeah. Throw your hat in the ring, get in there, build some equity because in Texas we've been consistent maybe five six percent year over year and then all of a sudden it was like 15 20 25 percent okay now it's coming down by two percent wait a minute it went up by two percent so we haven't really lost much of anything um but it's that whole concept of i want to be around this area yeah i want to be around the friends and the nightlife or whatever the case may be i think there needs to be more education more education and more people listening and understanding the why behind it um and how it can affect them five years from now instead of tomorrow. Right. Best time to buy a home was, was right yesterday. No, <laughs> best time yesterday. to buy a home was 1978. Yeah. <laughs> the next best it was time yesterday. is yesterday. Yes, exactly well, we right. say, best time was yesterday. Yeah. I mean, really. It's, well, yeah. As long And what I always say is you can't lose in real estate unless you sell. Um, there was a video that I came across and it, the headline was, don't buy a home in 2023. And I was like, look at this Wahoo talking nonsense. I hit play and he gave some good reasons as to why you shouldn't buy a home. He basically said, if you are planning to sell the home within 12 months to a year, don't do it. I agree with that wholeheartedly. It's always been that way. Fundamental rule in real estate. And I think we need to go back to fundamental. Yeah. Yeah. So in other words, you got you to click. Hell yeah, he Which did. Is that guy's goal. I'm like, look at this guy. He thinks he knows what he's talking about, and he got me. But I had to agree with him because, he, in my yeah. opinion, the guy brought valid reasons, and I agree with those reasons. If you are thinking that you're going to buy a home to make money, you're already going into it incorrectly, yeah. especially as a first-time buyer. But the last two to three years, that was a fluke. If you made money during that time, great. Yeah. That was an anomaly. <laughs> and, it, and it happened. I, I I just, yeah. Anyway, what, what happened to buy? Very fortunate a home? to some people who needed to sell a home quickly yes. that they were able to make money. Absolutely, because that is not the norm. But yeah. all those people had to pay taxes on those gains because True. they didn't hold it long enough, and now you became an investor and weren't even ready for it. So now, what are you going to do? Go throw away and rent? You know, <laughs> it's just one of those things that um, y- you can lead a horse to water, but you can't hold its head down and make him drink. So now that we've done all this, <laughs> when do we start recording for the show? <laughs> That's awesome. I'm, I'm warm now. I'm, let's do the let's, show. I'm fired up too. <laughs> Hell yes. That's awesome. <laughs> Guys, that is a great um, conversation that we had all That's the way fun. around. Heck Thank yes. You. Thanks, baby. You're welcome. Yeah. Hey. Great job. Thanks. I didn't want to come. Can you believe you guys? <laughs> she was super nervous about coming in here and jumping on the microphone. <laughs> She's a natural. She is. Thanks, guys. Yeah. <laughs> That's awesome. Well, uh, the goal is to have this thing out by tomorrow or the following day. Um, I think it's going to get great. Um, I don't know, whatever you want to call that. I'm, it's not clout. Just <laughs> great publicity, whatever. Yeah. Do you Como se vo or whatever. <laughs> whatever it is. Um, but I do appreciate you guys coming on and um, being honest with folks, telling them what 
is Always. actually going on because the show is called Key Factors. Yeah. And there were many key factors listed today. Um, and folks listening probably need to go back, grab a pen and paper and write those down <laughs> and use them to elevate your career in some way, shape or form, whether in your real estate, uh, mortgage, entrepreneur. I don't care if you work at Starbucks. <laughs> can I can I say it? Please. Like and subscribe. <laughs> Do you go like this? Yes. Link in the bio. Well, do you guys want to say anything else? Nope. No. You good? Great. Okay. Thanks, well, Mark. Absolutely. Um, guys, thank you for tuning in. Um, hopefully you got something out of this. And like Charlie said, make sure to like and subscribe. I've got some things over here and over there and all that good stuff. Did you get that one? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but that being said, we'll catch you on the next one.